He paid for all of the sins, for all of the people, for all of time. You know, it doesn't take a double doctoral or a master's work. I'm not poking fun at anybody. Be who God created you to be, please. It always boils down to our relationship with Jesus. That, it, that relationship affects everything in our lives. God chose Israel. Our founding fathers chose God. Be a doer of the word. Because faith without works is dead, for real. That's religion, that's knowledge, that's intellect. You need to go out there and engage with your world and own your liberty. We started a new series called Foundation Stones. And I am probably more excited about doing this than any other series that I've ever done. And I don't think I'm honestly just saying that because it's the one that we're in, which you, you tend to be that way. If you're, whatever you're doing at the moment is like the most important thing you could ever possibly do. But I realize that as we've been tracking that God has led us to this place and it's really gonna take people that have embraced the things in the, in the last series about being a hero it's really going to take you embracing the reality that God created you to be a hero, that Christ is on the inside of you, and he is your image of being a hero, and he's calling you to be in that same image. And so this entire series is going to kind of wrap itself around what is the image of Christ, what is the image of God, what is the context of the kingdom, and how does that relate to our culture here at Beloved. These are gonna be foundational messages of things that, that I, we, and I believe obviously Jesus believes as well, specifically for a family. And I, I don't think that a lot of people understand this in the body of Christ, but Jesus did not intend for the universal church, which just so you guys know, that word is Catholic, there was a Catholic church before there was a Roman Catholic church. Catholic means universal. So the universal body of Christ, the universal church, is not supposed to be a bunch of cogs that come out of the machine that were stamped by the press that all look exactly the same, walk exactly the same, talk exactly the same. And I, and I think that people get that in generality, but they don't know exactly what that application is. And I, I pray that you've gotten to some extent a, uh, at, at least an inkling of the fact that God has created beloved church to be unique. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> We're weird. The Bible word is peculiar. Not being weird for weird sake, but being weird as in not normal. If you remember what the new normal was about three years ago, mask on, six feet apart, hiding in your basement, in the fetal position, hoping that the microscopic virus didn't kill you twice, that is not the normal that we are. We are weird. We believe God heals. We believe that the kingdom of God is greater, bigger, and more powerful than the kingdom of America. We believe that Christ is king. Those are weird, weird concepts to anybody outside of the kingdom. And then there's even weirder things that we are uniquely. We have prophetic words over our culture of who we are. One of them I just alluded to that we've prophetically been called, I think it was about eight years ago, that we were prophetically declared to be the healthiest, wealthiest, and most influential entity in the region. That was the words. And I've embraced it. At, when I first heard it, I, I, I didn't resist it, but I didn't necessarily embrace it. 
you know, you don't have to just one or the other. Like, I hate you, get away from me. Oh, I love you, you're my favorite. There's actually some in-between stuff. And that's where I was, I was in between on it. One of the reasons is because I've struggled on the financial aspect of it for ever. <laughs> when we first planted the church, I, my intentions financially were to be the anti-church. And what I mean by that was we didn't take an offering for, who, who remembers, three years, four years? We didn't take an offering for three or four years. We didn't get paid too, shocking. Because I wanted to be the anti-church. I seen how bad money had been jacked up in the body of Christ. And so my intentions were, well, since they jacked up money so bad in this one area over here, I'm gonna go in this other ditch. I'm gonna show them we're gonna be the anti-church. And I, I've come out of the ditch, but I'm not in the center of the road. And it must be so pronounced to God that he literally had Andrew Womack prophesy over Kay and I three or four days ago. And he, he laid his hands on me and he said, oh, he said, you're just like me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, father, <laughs> just like Andrew. He said, you're just like me. He said, you struggle with money. He said, you limit God in the financial part of your life because you don't want to talk about it. You're... I'm like, nobody asked for this prophecy. You just walked up here. <laughs> and Kay standing next to me, amen, amen, <laughs> amen, Andrew. You preach it. <laughs> Woman. And I'm sitting there as my spiritual father in the faith is telling me that I kind of suck at this area. And I'm receiving it. I know. I'm not unaware of the fact that I, I struggle in this area. I just don't know exactly how to bring it because I want to do it balanced if and when I do it. I'm not there yet, so don't worry. I'm not going to preach on money today. But if I'm struggling with it, and I've been doing this a long time, and I'm way farther down the road than many folks in this room. I understand that, but I'm nowhere near where God wants me to the point where he literally had Andrew Womack, probably one of the biggest ministers in the world, prophesy to me that I'm not there. Amen. Ouch. So this, let this exhort you to the fact that I understand, I embrace the fact that God has called us to be the healthiest, wealthiest, most influential group of people, uh, church in the region, and I'm not there yet. God calls those things that be not as though they are. <laughs> in God's heart, we are. In my heart, I'm not there yet. In your heart, you're probably not there yet. You know, there are probably some people in here like, hey, I go to a good little beloved church over there in that little town, Lena. And that is your perspective of it. That is your belief system. You don't see like, beloved church, influence the world, influence the entire region. What are you talking about? That's crazy, preacher. Are you just trying to be rich and famous or whatever? Nope. I'm trying to be what my father has prophesied for me to be. And I struggle with it as much as you do. But that doesn't give me the permission to not believe it and not fix what I need to fix to get where he's asked me to go. And us doing this Foundation Stone series, I, on, I believe is going to right the ship in a lot of places because if we don't uniquely believe what we beloved church are called to be inside the universal church the universal body of Christ. We are going to be a unique entity, as unique as your left hand is to your gallbladder. We are gonna be a hand to the body of Christ. Whatever part of the body of Christ beloved church has been called to be, we're gonna be that. And if the liver looks at us and says, man, you guys are strange. Well, we think you're strange but we're all part of the same body. You do the liver stuff, we'll do the hand stuff. 
I'm okay with that. I'm, okay. I'm also okay with the fact that it's not going to be seeker sensitive. Not every single person that walks in the door is going to come in here and say, oh, this is the most wonderful place ever. And that preacher, he's my favorite. I, I get that, that people are going to be like, this guy, amen. I'm not going to kill him, but slash his tires, maybe. I, I understand that there are going to be people that aren't going to listen to what I have to say. Not, they're not going to engage in the worship that we engage in. They're not going to receive the prophetic words that we receive. They're not going to change the things in their lives that you and I might be willing to change in our lives. I get that. And guess what? There are tons of churches out there. If you just want the 55-minute check the box, three points in a poem, two songs, one fast, one slow, and call it good, take your pick. And some of them will have transgendered preachers. So... Do, do what you got to do. I'm totally okay with that. But I know what God wants us to be, and, and that's why I repeat, and I'm not saying this in any kind of offensive way, but it is important for us to embrace the fact that God's calling us to be a family. Us to be a family. Not to the exclusion of your family, but to the fact that God has called us a unique tribe. We're were the Levitical tribe to the 12 tribes. And the Levites were different than the people that were in, of the tribe of Ephraim. I'm okay with that. They were okay with that. We can be okay with that. But this is our family. We live and die. We will fight for. We will defend. We will create safe spaces for each other. We're going to challenge each other. We're going to call fat, fat. We're going to call sin, sin. And we're going to love the people that we're calling fat and calling sin. I know there's a lot of people, especially the gals, struggle with that. You can't call me fat and love me. Watch me. <laughs> this. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and preach this sermon now. The, the name, oh, praise the Lord. If you didn't think we were weird before that. The name of this is information. And I, and I wrote the word the way that it was entomologically created to be, which is in formation. The formation in side of you. That's the reason that we get data and information. It's supposed to go into you and form who you are, solidify who you are. You get bad information. You get bad data. When we were younger, some of the, the young people will not remember anything like this, but we used to, our computer systems used to be all DOS-based. And when your computer got so slow, that your dial-up internet would just basically not connect after about five minutes, after you figured out that it was your daughter on the phone or something like that. You finally accepted the fact that you had to do some computer work. And one of the things that you had to do was called a defragmentation. And what defragmentation was, was it, it took all these gaps on your hard drive. And some of you were like geeky like me, where you actually sat there and you watched it. And you seen this gap and it took these data bits and it put them in this gap and it fit perfectly and then ch 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 and it filled out. It was like Tetris for, for weirdos. And I would sit there and watch it. I'm like, because the reason I would watch it is because I'm like, that made my computer faster. That made my computer faster. That made my computer. Every time it took a chunk and it filled in one of those gaps, that made my computer faster. That made my computer faster. I want you to look at some of these things that we're going to do over this series, and we're going to fill in the gaps, and we're going to take the truths of the Word of God, and we're going to put them in the right place, and it's going to make your life more successful. It's going to make your life faster. It's going to make your life better. It's going to make your revelation flow easier. It's going to make things work the way they were intended to work before all the fragmentation of the bad data and all the deletes and all the pain came into your life. And so we're going to inform our lives. Inside, form our lives the way God created them to be. And this process is going to take a while. 
I read a story that I think it was in the 30s that they built the Hoover Dam. Somebody can probably correct me, they're smarter than I am. But I think it was in the 30s, no, the 50s maybe, that they built the Hoover Dam. Anyway, you can look it up. But I, I, the story that I read was that there are places inside the Hoover Dam that the concrete yet has not cured. They poured the concrete so thick, that dam is so thick, and the concrete was so deep, and so much of it, that there are literally like these inside places in the Hoover Dam that is uncured concrete. And yet it holds back a lake. And some people are looking at their life and, and they're saying, well, I'm holding back all this junk over here. Yeah, but there's still places that need to be cured on the inside of each of us. And I pray that you let that happen, that in formation to happen. The subtitle of it is... Padia, which is a Greek word, and we're going to get there in a minute. Only when your heart is firmly planted on a good foundation do you have the stability to truly help yourselves, yourself and others. Only when your heart is firmly planted on a good foundation do you then have the stability to actually help your life and help others. I think one of the things that has caused tons of damage in modern Christianity is unhealthy people telling other people how to do Christianity. If you ain't got it figured out, shut your mouth. We are so quick to offer everybody anytime our opinions. And most of the time we ain't even got our, opin our opinions formed. It's just, it's just talking to talk. Some people can't even turn it off. I got called the other day by a guy whose life is messed up. Messed up. And it took us three weeks to set the phone call. Three weeks, because that's how jacked up my schedule sometimes is. And so we scheduled a time where I knew that I could be separated under this phone call, because I knew that this guy had issues in his life. And he called me right on time, right on the minute. Way to go, buddy. Hey man, what's happening? Hey pastor, thanks for, thanks for the time. Thanks for taking my call. Yep, no problem. What's up, man? And I did not speak a word for 58 minutes. Not one. And at the end of 58 minutes, I said, hey bro, I've got about a minute and a half left before I gotta be at the next thing because I have a hard line on this hour, at the end of this hour. Can I pray for you? Yeah, pray for me, man. So he got a 90 second prayer. After 58 minutes of me telling, of him telling me how he's gonna solve the problems of the world. Jacked up life. And the more I hang out with Andrew and some of those incredible people, I see this all the time, that people get around successful, people and they just can't do it. They can't hold back. They just got to tell these successful people all the reasons that they're more successful than these successful people. If you don't have something figured out, please don't try to allude to the fact that is very disingenuous. Don't allude to the fact that you have it figured out and then you're going to tell someone else how to figure it out. If you don't have fruit in that area of your life, if your soul is not in success in that place, don't replicate what's in your life in someone else's. This is so important. And I, I honestly don't think that we get it because we just got a bunch of these Christian platitudes and we'll pop off, well, are you following the Spirit? Are you reading the Bible? Are you praying? Stop it. We all got that. We're supposed to be praying, check. We're supposed to be reading the scriptures, check. We're supposed to be intimate with God, check. I hope that this room knows if you ain't got those three things in your life, of course you're screwed up. Duh. 
That's like saying, hey, I noticed that you were driving down the road the other day on four flat tires and it wasn't running right. What? What are you talking about? I thought that's how you're supposed to do it. You shouldn't have a driver's license. Go sit down. Take a bus. <laughs> you, hopefully, you get it. Like, if something's just not quite right, you go see the professional. You go see Scott down. And you're like, hey, I, I just, this is beyond my understanding. And Scott has spent a life of learning and training himself on exactly how to make sure that the problems that are beyond you get sorted. And then because you're a good Christian, you thank him and pay him. <laughs> because you value what he offered you. A wise person takes the stones that their enemies throw and builds a strong house. One of the greatest things that ever happened to Steve Castle was the pandemic. I'll, until something greater happens, I'm going to let people know all over the world. One of the greatest things that ever happened in Steve Castle's life was the pandemic. It's positively affected our family. In the pandemic, I finished my master's degree, got my doctorate. In the pandemic, I fought the United States government. In the pandemic, we lost a third of our church and doubled our church. I don't, I don't want to do any of that stuff over again. In the pandemic, we took thousands of stones. If you don't believe me, ask Jessica Smith. She had to answer the phone. God bless her. Pray for Jessica because of the pastor she serves. <laughs> And we built a house out of all those stones. Going into that time, I realized that there was still some places of fear and insecurity in me that I had to work out. And being thrust into the fire, I let the Lord do what he needed to do, which was burn off the chaff, burn off the sticks, burn off the fear, and refine places in my life I didn't even know I had to refine. You know, sometimes you don't know what you don't know because you don't know. And then you're in the middle of the fight, you're like, oh, I should have taken judo before now. Yeah. <laughs> now you're in the fight. The foundation of a person is their character. The weaker the character, the more fragile the building. If there's one word that I could use to be the adjective of the progressive, modern, churchianity person, not most of you, most of you are good ones, I'll call you Christians, but churchianity, modern, progressive, churchianity attendees, one of the greatest adjectives, one of the most terrible adjectives that I would apply towards those folks is fragile. Fragile. I mean, just any old thing could devastate their lives. They are on the edge. I was listening to a, uh, a successful social media influencer. And this person is, he's, most of his activities revolve around trying to build masculinity. And he had a ton of good stuff to say and some really bad stuff. And you got to eat the meat and spit out the bones. But one of the things that he said was he was invited on this feminist show. He's not a Christian. He was invited on this feminist show to talk about masculinity. And this feminist like tried to take the entire hour to just blast him for being toxic masculinity and all this kind of stuff. And at the, at the end of the, it was actually five feminists that were on the show. And towards the end of the show, when they were taping it, there was a beat on the studio door and it was security like a guy showed up with a gun and he you know hates you feminine da, da, da. and this guy that was in there with five women that were all feminist and strong and we are women here are roar all five of those women told this guy what are you going to do to protect us how are you going to help us 
And he had this revelation in this moment, like there's feminism only works in ideology. It doesn't work in reality. Just like there's no atheists in foxholes. The bombs start dropping and the bullets start flying, you're crying to God. And he had a, a friend of his, a gal friend of his that came up to him a couple of weeks after this incident and she said, here's one of the things that you need to understand is that gals are so in tune with, sensitive to their, their emotions, their feelings, that, that soulish part of who they are. And she said this to him. She said that the average woman that you will meet is 24 hours away from a, uh, what's it called? I told you this, uh, having an emotional breakdown. And he's like, no way. She said, most of the women you're in contact with are 24 hours away from emotional breakdown. It would only take 24 hours of some of the worst stuff and they would be completely destroyed. And he argued with her. It's like, there's no way gals are that fragile. But when I heard that, I'm like, Christian, Christian, you know, we could sit right here and we could talk about how amazing God is. Amazing. And sing songs about his love and his grace and the fact that he's accepted us and how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God and, and declare to all the spiritual entities surrounding Lena that our God is the greatest God. And tomorrow by noon, you could be in the fetal position in the corner of your living room because you got a phone call about your dog has an ingrown toenail. <laughs> and I know these Christians. And I'm like, hey, that's a cool church you go to over there. You yeah, stay over there. But it's true that we have not informed our soul. We sang the song about the, how it is well with our soul. You know, the guy that wrote that song, he wrote that song on the ocean as he passed over the place where his wife and two daughters drowned to death. And he wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul. There are people in this room that I could come and tell you that your hair doesn't look pretty. And you would quit the church and maybe curse God. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> the ball, some of the bald guys are like, yeah, get those women, preacher. <laughs> All right, got it. But fragility is something that it's, it is like a pandemic in Christianity because Somehow we've been told or believe that we're supposed to be these, these excessively oversensitive, emotionally soulish, feely people because that's how you sense the spirit. Well, the spirit blew in like a wind and I felt it on my cheek and so I went this way. No, that was your neighbor farting on you. <laughs> that was not the spirit. That was totally not the spirit. You know how I know? I smelt it. And I know you think I'm being funny, but I'm not. Like th There are people that call things that are absolutely not God, God because they had a feeling, because they had an emotion, because they, they felt led to go do this thing. No, 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 that's not God. God don't lead that way. That's not how it works. Did you check the word? Well, yeah, I got this one half of scripture over here that I'm standing on. No, 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 not that. Like, did you actually build your life on the solid foundation of the word of God that hermeneutically goes across the entire scripture? Do you know that this principle works in Genesis 1 as much as Revelation 22? Because if it don't, it ain't the word. This is what creates the strength on the inside of you so that when things come, like, okay, now I have a toolbox of the word of God. I have a toolbox of the Spirit of God. And so based upon this situation, what do we need here? 
We need a wrench, screwdriver. Maybe we need a little tiny soldering iron. Maybe I need a blowtorch. And the Word of God has all these things, and for us to not use the right tool at the right time on the right thing, guess what you're going to do? You're going to tear it up, and you're going to call it God. And that is not okay. You want to tear up your life? Tear up your life. Do it. If, if, that, if that's the way you want to go, and there's a lot of people that go that way. I mean, there, there, are, there are people that come to this church. I'm, I'm fully aware. They've told me, I don't want anything to do with your God. I, I know you're thinking, why do they come here? Make sure you know why you come here. And they are, they are like hell-bent, helter-skelter on tearing up their life. And they're doing a good job of it. I, I know them. They're tearing it up good. But they're not calling it God. If you're going to tear up your life, tear up your life. You're free to do that. You're an American. You're whatever, whatever jacked up doctrine you got to give you the freedom to do whatever you want to do. Fine, apply that. Tear up your life, do it. But don't you dare call it God. Don't you dare. God doesn't tear up people's lives. God raises the dead. God heals the sick. And God brings light to dark places. And he is the author of bringing order to chaos. If you want to know where the devil is, it's in confusion. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, this is in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus was laying out his new Sinai. He was the new Moses, the new lawgiver for the new kingdom, the new king of the new kingdom. And he said, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is, it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. And that rock is Christ. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse. Because it's built on bedrock. It won't collapse. Notice what it didn't say. It didn't say it won't shake. It didn't say that it won't sound bad. It didn't even say that you might not have a power outage. You might not hear the siren go off because the storm, whatever. There's a lot of things it doesn't say. He just said it won't collapse. When you get through the storm and your building hasn't collapsed, you have achieved a safe place. I want us to be a safe place for people, for our families. For our culture, our jacked up culture, I want them to know, like, do I know anybody that's solid? Do I know anybody that's safe? Do I know anybody that didn't have their building collapse in the last storm or the next storm? Yep, me. Beloved church, the authentic Christians, we stood through the storm. The first steps to building our foundation stones is number one, the gospel. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto all that believe. Unto the Jew first, and then also unto the Gentile. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. In the gospel is where the righteousness of God is revealed. Not in somebody else's opinion, not in your loving Christian spouse that tells you how wonderful you are and affirms you over and over. That is not where your righteousness comes from. Your righteousness comes from the gospel. If you give a human permission to affirm you, you also give a human a permission to destroy you. Does that mean that we shouldn't affirm each other? No, that's not what I said. But if you give a person's words to affirm you, 
then you're giving a person's words the ability to destroy you. So when we affirm each other, be thankful. Be, be very, be filled with joy and gratitude that you, you have people in your life that actually care enough to affirm you. But don't let their affirmation build you. And don't let their lack of affirmation destroy you. And that goes for the greatest person. If Andrew would have prophesied over me and said, hey, you're the worst Christian in the world, and I don't ever want you to come back to my ministry. I did, had to suck it up. It's his ministry. That's what he said. I don't think that my father says that. That's not how I interpret the scriptures and, and Jesus' opinion of me. But that's what Andrew says. Okay. I won't come back. And I'm going to have to go home. I have to get the scriptures. And I'm going to spend time with the Spirit. And I'm going to have to <clears throat> make sure that I get everything right. But it, it, it doesn't matter the size, the magnitude of the voice, or the, the non-value of the voice. You cannot let people have the, have the authority to affirm you or destroy you. Dennis Prager said <clears throat> that if you, if you let other people's praise get into your head, then you'll let their condemnation get into your heart. And it's real quick for us to accept praise from other people, which means that it's also, your heart is also as quick to accept condemnation from other people. The next step is repent and believe. Once you hear the gospel, you are not saved. <laughs> that is the power to be saved. And, that, and I'm using the term saved as in that one unique moment where you crossed from darkness to light, where you went from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, where you went from death to life, where you went from hell to heaven. I'm using that term saved in that way, but I'm also using the term in the way that we all need it today. You need to be saved today. Yes. Oh, come on now. I'm in a church. You need to be saved today. There are more processes to your salvation that are present tense. And, shocker, there are future tense contexts to the word salvation. There are things you're going to need God to save you in the future from and with. So salvation has happened, salvation is happening, and salvation will happen. And you need to be saved. And the way that you're going to be saved is the way that you were first saved. You heard the gospel, you believed. God wants to save your finances. How does God save your finances? He tells you the good news about finances in the kingdom, and then you believe it. When that happens, you experience salvation. What Allie testified earlier to, God told her some good news, and she believed it, and brought salvation into an area of her life that she didn't have five minutes before that. Does that mean that she was dying and going to hell before that? No. We, we do not understand this word doesn't mean that. That's not the way Jesus used the word. That's not the way Paul, Peter, all the... That's the way the Baptists use the word. We're not Baptists. Am I at the right church? We're not that. We're not save law, save law, save law, save law, save laws. And we're also not once saved, always saved. Well, I did, I, you know, I got, I got dipped when I was eight days old, sprinkled when I was 12 at youth camp. I'm good. <laughs> you know, you have to believe. And it's not a one-time deal. Just because you believed once, amen. That'd be like someone saying, well, I had breakfast once. <laughs> Repent and believe, Mark 1.15. This is what... John the Baptist said, this is what Jesus said, that the time for the kingdom of God to come into your life is now. It's fulfilled. So what do you have to do? Repent. 
Amen. Everybody's favorite word? Repent and believe. It's not just repent. Repent's like the... the uh. yeah. Believe is the yes. And these are both associated. Amen. When we had our children, there was the... Uh. Kids, they're going to spit on me. They're going to poop on me. They're going to scream at me. They're going to not do all the stuff I want them to do. And they're going to be some of the greatest blessings in our life. Amen. Repent and believe. And then there is an, a, a place that you have to declare your allegiance to what you believe. There's a process of you actually believing it, but then you come to that place where you're not trying to believe it, now you believe it. And in that place, you declare that allegiance. And this is Romans 10, 9, and 10 that we use all the time to try to lead someone into being born again. But this scripture wasn't just a one-time evangelistic scripture. This is the scripture for us to apply the belief systems in our life, which it says, if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Notice, confess, the belief and the confession work together. You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. And that's not just saved like from hell. That's saved from everything. Is Jesus the Lord of your soul, your emotions? Is Jesus the Lord of your finances? If you don't know, bring me your checkbook register. I'll tell you. It's not that hard to figure out. Is Jesus the Lord? Now, you could be, Jesus could be your Savior in a lot of areas. He saved me. And so I'm, it, I'm happy sometimes. That's, that's not actually Lordship. Lordship doesn't have happy. Lordship has joy. And joy doesn't change. It's a constant. Happiness is up and down. Anybody testify to that? And then the part that we're dealing with in this, in this series is going to be this fourth bullet point, which I want everybody to understand. This is the context of what we're doing. The rest of our Christian life is to remain loyal and to grow in trust. I believe everybody here either has or should have heard the gospel for the, the salvation of your life. That's the reason you're in a church, I pray. And I believe that you heard that good news about what Jesus has done for you, what he did about your sin, your sin nature. And because you heard that good news, you responded by repenting from the bad way your life was going. And then you believed the way that God wanted your life to go. And so you transferred yourself from one kingdom to another. And then you start working out a lot of the areas of your life and you confess the lordship of Christ over these areas of your life. And then the totality of the remainder of the Christian life is to actually grow and develop in those areas, to remain loyal to the places that you've confessed your loyalty and to believe in greater levels, which is... The Bible word for believe, I like the word trust. As you grow in trust with God, you'll believe him. As Kay, Kay and I are 28 years, almost 20, no, we're our 28 years into being married. We trust each other now more than we did the day that we got married. We loved each other the day we got married. And we love each other now. But we trust each other now more than we did when we first got together. Trust is something that takes time, takes effort on both parts. You can infinitely trust Jesus. Can he trust you? This is a theological statement that I, uh, a term that I like to use, which is called believing loyalty. My, the way I like to say it is faith allegiance. I am allegiant to Christ and I'm allegiant to being in faith with him. The concept is alluded by the Old Testament word hasid or hasid, 
and we'll do a message on that soon. But that is, every time you see that word, if you want to have some fun, go look up the word hased in the Old Testament and look at all the places that it was used. If you don't know how to look up hased, then go into your King James Bible and find the word loving kindness, which is not even a real word. Like they created a word because they didn't know how to do the word. Because the word hased isn't a trans... Uh, it, you cannot translate it into an English word, even into an English concept, because it is this massive, massive thing that the word hased just is a placeholder for you to go look at this great big massive thing. We would use the term hyperlink. When you're reading through an article and they use this one little word, like what does that word even mean? I've never even heard that word. And it's in blue because it's a hyperlink and you click on the blue and it takes you to this 500 page article about what that one word meant. That's the word hased. It's a hyperlink to this massive concept that was alluded throughout the entire Old Testament. That is our life. Our life is to live in believing loyalty and faith allegiance with God for the rest of our lives. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 1, it says, Understand this. In the last days, terrible times will come. Yep, that's in your Bible. In the last days, terrible times will come. Does any... Does anybody think, based upon that statement, that we could be in the last days? Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. If, if, if you're not looking around and seeing some terrible, we'll, we'll have a healing line for you after the service so that your eyes can be open, your blind eyes can be open. Because if you look out there and you don't see terrible, they're cutting the healthy body parts off of teenagers by law, and they're trying to pass federal and state laws to do more of it. They're trying to chemically castrate our children. There are more, there was a 400% increase in the last uh, seven years, eight years, something like that. 400% increase in young people that do not know their gender. They are gender confused. 400% increase. Is there anything? Well, I, no, I can't even say that now. In times past, all of you that are over 25, 15 years ago, I would have said, is there anything more easy for someone to understand than their gender? You would have said, of course. Duh. If you don't know that, like especially around here, because this is farm community, if you ever think that a cow and a steer, you, you get that confused and you go try to milk the wrong thing, you'll find out in a hurry that there's two genders. Amen. And don't wear a red shirt when you're doing it. We, this is the place that we've gotten to. This is terrible. It's terrible that they're targeting our children. What's even more terrible is that the Parents, I, I mostly put the blame on the fathers, that the fathers aren't protecting their children from this. Just, well, you know, I got, I got sitcoms to watch and I got a job to go to. My job is to bring home the bacon. No, your job is to raise your children. I'm going to get off that. And understand this, in the last days, terrible times will come. Verse 10 says, you, however, you, you know who... Paul's talking to us, the people of God, specifically Timothy, but we are going to be raised under the same nurture and admonition of the Lord that Timothy was raised by Paul. You, however, have observed my teaching. Check this out. Listen to the arrogance and the narcissism of the apostle Paul. You, however, have listened to my teaching. My conduct, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my perseverance, my persecutions, and the sufferings that come upon me in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, what persecutions I endured. 
Yet the Lord rescued me from them all. I pray that you're picking up on this. Paul was so secure, and the Holy Spirit canonized that security by letting Timothy, a leader that Paul raised, that you have every right to look at all the things in my life. In fact, I believe that I did it right to the degree that I want you to not only look at the things in my life, but emulate them. He didn't say, did you see Christ's sufferings? Did you see Christ's persecutions? Have you noticed Christ's faith? Have you no Do we all know where Paul got it from? But we're 2,000 years late to see Jesus do it in person. How are we going to see it? I'm going to watch Ellie. I'm going to watch Cinderella. How, how does this, how do people get through terrible problems? Well, I'm going to watch Steve and Kay get through the terrible problem in their marriage that they had because Steve was a complete raging jerk. That's how I'm going to know how to figure it out. I'm going to see uh, Missy just testified, Chris's wife Missy just testified last a couple nights ago. She got a $10 an hour increase because the Holy Spirit led her and Chris to fix something in their marriage. Amen. Amen. Now, I want you to track this. God, I need more money. Can you just drop it from the sky into my living room in a pot? Hey, how about you fix your marriage? Hey, I don't think you're listening to me, God. I said money. Right. Hey, how about you fix your marriage? Hello, is anybody up there? I need money. Fix your marriage. I think the Lord's saying something. <laughs> Yet the Lord rescued me from them all. If you're watching another person's life, if you're watching someone that you respect, if you're watching authentic believers go through the problems of life, don't stop watching till you see the end. Yet the Lord rescued me from them all. Paul wasn't saying that he was awesome. Paul was saying that the Lord was awesome from rescuing him through all these things, but he went through all these things. And there's value for one another for us to show, understand, have revelation of the things that we go through. Amen. That's part of community. You can't get that from YouTube, preacher. Amen. You don't get to see their lives. You don't know what's going on behind the closed doors. You want to know what's going on in Stephen Kay's marriage? Come over. You can stay at our house. We've had lots of people stay at our house. We ain't scared. You might have to sleep in weird places, but that's okay. We'll let you. You have to cook me cookies. <laughs> Verses 12 and 13 together. Paul told Timothy, indeed, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Anybody know what all means in the Greek? Oh. Which tells you not everyone desires to live godly. And don't think that you're persecuted because that one person three years ago said something terrible to you on Facebook about being a Christian. That's not persecution. Please go back and reread the couple of verses before this where he was actually persecuted, suffered, arrested, beaten, striped, thrown in prison on the, on the, the ocean for a night and a day in fastings often, in hungers, in coldness, in darkness. Please don't call your persecution persecution unless it's actually persecution. Those who, live, who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil men and imposters go from bad to worse, hello, deceiving and being deceived. There's some doctor that's really excited today because he had a great week of cutting the sexual organs off of children. He's having an awesome Sunday. He's on the golf course like, man, I am such a great guy. I operated on 12 kids this week. Deceiving and being deceived. They're doing what they're doing because they're under deception. And as much as we're going to shake our head and like, ah, 
Do you think there's any deception in your life? Is it possible there's things in your life that are not quite right, that are not lined up appropriately, and because you don't know, in your deception, you're not going to be undeceived. This is important, y'all. You don't know how you're deceived because if you knew how you're deceived, you wouldn't be deceived. But as for you, this is us, Verse 14, continue in the things you've learned and firmly believed since you know from whom you have learned them. I used to read that scripture like, well, it's Jesus. That's how I learned them. But you do know what he just said. Timothy, you watched me go through all these things. And he's going to tell us two ways that Timothy should totally know how to do his life. He's in a way like he's doing that father thing that fathers do. Son, these are the two things that you need to do. He's raising him up. He's pitying him. Verse 15, "From from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So he said, you got these two things. You got me. And you got the word. And between looking at those two things and bringing them into harmony, you should figure this out, Timothy. Because 16 and 17 says, all scripture is God breathed. Man, just saying that. And I, I need a word from God. Did you read your Bible? No, I need a real word. <laughs> Prophecy chasers. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for instruction in instruction in structure for conviction yay standing ovation for correction yay now we're jumping up and down in our standing ovation and for training in righteousness So that the man of God may be complete, fully equipped for every good work. You know what every means in the Greek? Is there anything in your life that you wished that you had a little bit more equipping of heaven to deal with that situation? God's got a solution. He's got God-breathed words just for you that are in the scriptures. And this word training here is padian. Padian, which is a noun. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you into a little bit of the, of the Greco-Roman context for this word. This is a hyperlink word. Like I was just saying about hased, this is a hyperlink Greek word that goes into this massive, massive context that I want you and I to grow in knowledge of. If the word of God is supposed to do this in our life, what is this that it does? In the amplified version of this verse, it says, all scripture is God-breathed, given by divine inspiration, and is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error, and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, and notice in brackets and parentheses, learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage. Man, is that a mouthful. And that's my desire right there. I want to live that way. I'm better than I once was. I'm not where I should be. So this word, padia, is how we're going to get there. This Greek word, padia, has no exact English translation. It's essentially the part of upbringing and education that forms the soul, informs the soul, instructures the soul. This is what we call character. 
It's a key to the formation of a culture. Our culture is a culmination of the character of the people. Politics, man, I hope you hear this. Politics is downstream of culture. What goes on in politics is what the culture wants. Now, you might be mad about that. You might be, why? Well, I don't want... No, you'll never talk to a single individual that says, hey, do you want cheating, lying, disgusting, pedophile politicians? No, of course not. Really? What are you doing about it? Well, I'm watching Netflix and chilling. Okay, well, then you do want that. Because that's what Netflix and chill makes. That's, that's what it produces. Politics is downstream culture. Culture is downstream church. That culture is because of us. God put the church here to take the kingdom of God into the gates of hell. And since the gates of hell look like they're doing a pretty good job of taking their wishes into the church, and I'm the senior pastor around here, I talk to lots of people all over the world, and there's a lot of darkness coming in those doors when we're supposed to be shining light out those doors. I can give you preachers. I'm not going to do it. In Greek culture, this word was massive and carried an entire manifesto of context, ideals, and applications. This word was a prominent hyperlink that would have leapt off the page for any Greek reader. It was a deep cultural concept that was over 300 years old at the time of the epistles. It was such a valuable aspect of Greek culture that the Romans carried it into their culture, which was extremely rare for Romans. It was known in Latin as humanitas. Humanitas which is where we get our English word humanities, which is a common field of scholarly study. In humanities, you study a culture, a society, their language, their ways, their arts. Their, that's what humanities is. This is literally now a 2,400-year-old concept that we even apply in our lives in today. In fact, our current, I don't know about current, but the, the former educational system was built on this model. We're going to teach them English. We're going to teach them math. We're going to teach them character. We're going to teach them uh, PE. We're going to teach them how to interact with each other. We're going to show them how to do their finances. We're going to show them how to sew a button on a shirt. We're going to show. We're going to take these kids. We're going to show them everything there is about how to be successful in life and teach them how to think so that they know how to be successful even in things that we don't teach them. It's the entire educational system that they intended for it to be, that God intended for it to be. That is what the Word of God and the application of looking at the Word working in other people's lives, that is the pedia that God intends for us to have in our lives. It should touch every part of our life. Every part. If there's an area of your life that doesn't get touched by the Spirit, God's way, the kingdom, then you are not in Padia to the word of God. Padia meant the process of educating man into his true form, the real and genuine human nature. They termed the end result the development of the good man. That's what the Greeks called it. If, they, if a person was successfully going through Padia, they would be intended to be the outcome of a good man a good citizen of that knowledge, a good student, a disciple. This was how the Greeks created their society and perpetuated it through generations. The Greeks knew that if they did not perpetuate their way of life over and over and over, they would lose it. Man, do I need to say that again? The America of today, go talk to any 80-year-old guy sitting at a cafe, drinking coffee, smoking a cigarette, and say, hey, what's different about today than it was when you were a kid? He'll probably cry. Yeah. He'll probably cry. 
because we did not perpetuate what the culture was supposed to be. There's probably equal number of young people that have love for socialism as they do love for um, the American capitalistic system. We didn't perpetuate our... Don't think that your kids are picking stuff up on osmosis. And don't think that the people sitting around you in Christianity are picking up stuff on osmosis from Jesus either. This ideal of man was the pattern and the model towards which all Greek educators, poets, artists, and philosophers always looked. This was the, what they were aiming for. It incorporated the instruction and the, the instructure, the instruction and practice of these concepts. Education, which was meant to be the uh, learning the necessary processes of thinking. <laughs> That's what education is supposed to be. Is learning how to think. <laughs> it, is, it is nowhere near that. That's what it was supposed to be. The Greek folks were probably way smarter than our, our society. Language, which meant to write, to speak, and to do all forms of communication effectively. We used, to, we used to chew our kids out all the time because we'd call them on their cell phones that we paid for. And I'd call my kid and I would hear it click. Baby girl, you there? Yeah. Say hello. Hello. Baby girl, when you answer the phone, the way you answer the phone is you open up the phone, flip phone, you open up the phone and you say, hello, and then the other person knows that you're ready to hear what needs to be said. And now she's a boss at her work because she does things that the other people around her doesn't do. They, they don't know how to answer the phone. <laughs> say hello. You have to train communication. You have to teach these things. Just the other day, we were at Grace Group, and Ollie was sitting in a chair, and, and Tammy didn't have anywhere to sit. Tammy was just going to sit on the floor. I said, Ollie, get up. Sit on the floor. Let Tammy sit down. And he stared at me like I had a face mask on. <laughs> Ollie, you're a gentleman. You get up for the ladies. Right. Ollie, sit on the floor. That's what gentlemen do. Gentlemen give up their seat for ladies. Sit on the floor. Okay, Pastor Steve got his little pillow, sat on the floor. And Tammy sat down. He, he's not going to pick that up accidentally. Right. Communication, being effective with the communication. You have to do these things on purpose. You have to teach these things. You have to model these things. Trade skills. I, I'm so blessed. My son decided he wants to fix cars. And I'm only blessed by that is because... He watched his father try to fix everything in the house. Broke some of it, but it actually rubbed off on him. He, 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 he now wants to fix stuff. Our, the rest of our society wants to break stuff. My son wants to fix stuff. That's a blessing. And, and I'm happy to show him. He'll come over, like, change your oil. Like, hey, you got to do this, and this is how you get the oil filter off when it's really tight. And here's a, hey, here's a little mechanic trick that I learned when I was your age, and... and Trade skills, learning how to do these things. It's, but this is part of pedeia, which is doing these things. We're supposed to do these in the kingdom. Why? Well, I, I was sick, and, and I don't know how to get healed. Oh, well, let me show you. This, this is how we operate in divine health. Hey, I'm going through this problem in my marriage, and I don't know how I need to... Oh, hey, let me show you. And we went through problems in our marriage, too, and I, here's some scripture on this, and this is... Oh, okay. We're supposed to be doing these trade skills. This, this was part of Padea. Music and art. These were meant to be noble sources of joy to have and to share. They used to teach art and music to help develop the information of the character of a person. Now they... I don't want to tell you what song was number one last year. Character, virtues. These things were actually taught. 
When's the last time you were walking through a public school and you heard some teacher talk about character and virtue? <laughs> Maybe virtue signaling. Sexuality. We're supposed to be teaching these things. Well, my kid will figure it out. Yeah, they'll figure it out behind the gym with the dirty magazine from the older guy that showed them how to do it. That's how they're going to figure it out. I'll almost guarantee that nobody in this room, zero people in this room, your first sexual encounter was godly. Quiet. I've been, yeah, that's quiet. I've been doing, I've been, Kay and I have been doing marriage covenant stuff for about five years now, taking marriage conferences. And I have yet to be in a room with Christian, spirit-filled Christians. And I said, raise your hand if your first sexual encounter was godly. I have yet to get a hand anywhere we've ever gone. And we wonder why the society is wheels off in their sexuality. Because we, the church, are not pedaying the society the way that we're supposed to. What does the Word of God say about it? Well, the Word of God says that it's supposed to be a covenant between one man and one woman who are both virgins that got together under the auspices of God their Father. That's how it's supposed to be. You, you don't use people like used cars. Where you go try them out for a while. Well, that didn't work. And then you tear off a chunk of their soul and you go into the next relationship and you try them out for a while. People aren't horses. You don't ride them for a while and put them away. They're human. They're the most valuable thing on earth. And to be in that level of intimacy and not doing it the way that God intended for two humans to operate means you're going to break it. And oftentimes the broken part of it is you. And then you've got to cry out to God to put you back together. And he will. But don't break it. It's a precious gift. Health. They actually incorporated health into Padea. They taught people how to do gymnastics. They actually valued the human physique. You, you don't believe me? Go look at Greco statues, Greek statues. These Greek statues... He looked like a Greek god. Why do we say things like that? Because we see the Greek culture and we see these sculpted bodies and these very healthy looking people. Why? Because they padea in their society. They say, hey, you're not supposed to be a glutton. You're supposed to take care of your body. Your health is a derivative of how you take care of your body. Well, I feel really lethargic, and, I, and I, all the time I'm just tired, and my body hurts, and I went up the stairs, and I lost my breath, and I, you're supposed to take care of your body. They actually taught these things. We don't. Hey, welcome to Christianity. You want a donut? That's how you get people to come to the church. Hey, come to our church. We got great coffee and donuts. That is not what we're supposed to be doing. That is not what the Word of God is doing. The Word of God is supposed to pedea our entire life, which means teach us how to... Re they actually had... One of the things they said is that you had to repudiate gluttony and excess. Imagine if I made everybody stand up, raise their right hand to God, and you repudiate gluttony and excess. Next week's message will be the least attended message I've ever preached. In the Bible, the word padea is used in a few different ways. In Ephesians 6, 4, Paul tells fathers to bring up their children in the training and the instruction of the Lord. God wants to padea you through parents, fathers in the faith. So Paul is saying that fathers should raise their children in a way that teaches them about becoming the good man in the new and different culture of the kingdom from the Lord. Another use of the word padea is in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which we just read, all scripture is God-breathed and is equipping us for good works. Padea, the word of God is padea in us for good works, godly works. Good is a God word. God is a good word. In both of these passages, the word padea is used to describe a comprehensive process of education and formation, heart, mind, body that is designed to produce a person who is wise, virtuous, 
and capable of knowing and doing good works. This is the process of discipleship and fathering as Paul wrote to Timothy. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says, I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my beloved children. What he's about to say, he says to those that he loves greatly. Listen to what he says. Even if you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. We have a fatherless nation and we have a fatherless Christianity. Fathers are leaving their children in our society and we don't have anybody in the body of Christ that is fathering others in the body. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. You know, if Steve Castle said that, it'd be on YouTube, it'd go viral in a second. Listen to this narcissistic preacher out in Lena. But the Apostle Paul says it under the canonization of the Holy Spirit. And nobody thinks twice about it. Yeah, that's right. You should be like Paul. You know, Paul was human. Is that shocking to anyone? That is why I have sent you, check this out. That is why I've sent you Timothy. That's who we just read. That's why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. And he will remind you of my way of life. In Christ Jesus, which is exactly what I teach everywhere in every church. Paul was so secure in being a man of God and producing a man of God in Timothy that he literally sent Timothy out and said, make other people like me. Padea. He was so confident in this process. The word of God was in Timothy. The spirit, the prophetic was on Timothy. He'd spent time with Timothy. He discipled Timothy. He fathered Timothy. He was so confident in that process and in the spirit of God that he literally sent Timothy out to go make other people like him. This concept of Padea is important for Christians because it reminds us that our education should not be limited to the acquisition of knowledge, but true information. True education should include the formation of our character and the development of our spiritual life together. As Christians, we should be seeking to be educated in the ways of the Lord so that we can be equipped to live lives that are pleasing to him. And I got more here, and so I'll finish this next week. Next time. Hasta luego. And when we finish this, I'm, there's even greater context to what I'm saying. It is not just you're going to read the Bible and become an out pops Jesus. There are so many uh, nuances, so much things that we have to do in our heart. We have to let things from our souls go. We have to cut anchors and cut ties in our souls with stuff and things and people and ways. We have to retransform the way that we think. And we have to actually work these things out, walk them out in the actual, in the lab. That's why in science class, you don't just learn that uh, H2 and O makes water. They make you tear apart table saw. You got to add this to this to this to this. And if you add the wrong stuff, you blew up the lab. Then you get suspended. That's what happened to me. <laughs> There, there is a lab that needs to happen, and that lab is beloved church. We should be the lab for these things taking place. We should be loving each other in a way that people say, hey, you love me good here, but over here, yeah, not so good. Okay, sorry. I repent. I apologize. I'm going to love you better. Okay, I know. I love you back. This is the lab that God intended for his people to have, and we've got to be able to do it well. All right, so please rise. I'd like to bless you.
now please receive the blessing that the Father has for you. He calls you beloved, the ones that are greatly loved. And we, he and I both desire that you experience prosperity and his type of divine health. And the way this happens is by allowing your soul to prosper through intimacy with him and knowledge of his word. I love you and I'll see you again soon.